Good morning, everybody. We are so excited to have you here once again for Center Point Live. We want to share this time with you. We want to worship with you. We want to celebrate who God is. So wherever you are, whether you're sitting on your couch, at your desk, watching on your phone, would you just join us in worship as we, as we lift up our voices, praise our Lord all together. You are the word at the beginning. One way.
here at Center Point Christian Fellowship. We love being able to at least share virtual church with you, but just like we know you are, we are really ready to get back together. Uh, this is my sister-in-law, Carrie, my son, Xander. We are your worship team. Uh, Carrie's been with us since coronavirus started and they shut things down. Um, and we are just loving being able to share this time with you. Uh, for those of you who would like to give, um, we have worship with our voices and this is a chance to worship with our offerings. We have two ways for you to give. One is for you to mail in your offerings. That goes to P.O. Box 1998 in Dayton, Nevada. Uh, the zip code is 89403. You can also give online by going to centerpointcf.com. Click on the Give Online box. Go a couple of clicks in. It'll take you to our PayPal donation page. You don't need to have a PayPal account. 
All you need to have is a uh, debit card or a credit card and you can give that way. If you're on our Facebook live stream, on our main Facebook page, right there at the top there is a sign up button and that will take you to our Give Online page as well. Now, if you're sitting in your home, sitting with a family, with friends, with a dog, a cat, uh, just give them a little squeeze right now. Share this time, let them know you're with them. Give them a little hug. And uh, let's just share this time uh, with, with Pastor Tony. He's got a great message for us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Heather. And good morning. I want to start this morning with a question. Can people really change? Are we hardwired by the genetics to act or think a certain way? Can we overcome the lack of lessons that we've learned in our early childhood? You know, those are some pretty big questions. But I have a few examples that suggest people really can change. For example, did you know that before Gene Simmons was the lead singer for the 70s rock group KISS, that he was actually a 6th grade teacher in Harlem? That certainly seems like a significant change to me. Before he played an astronaut and fished in the middle of a river and traveled back through time, Brad Pitt spent his days standing outside in a chicken costume, enticing customers into an El Pollo Loco restaurant. Before she was whipping up French cuisine, Julia Child was an intelligence agent for the CIA. If there's one thing I've seen in my years of following Jesus, is that he can change us. And as you move forward in your journey with Jesus, who knows where he might take you or how you might change as we consider the changes he might want to make in us in our journey with him, we're going to take a broad look at two of the recognizable people who encountered Jesus and how their journey with him changed everything in their lives. In our exploration, I think you'll find some exciting insights for your journey with Jesus. Let's start by taking a look at Peter. The nice thing about Peter is that he gives us so much material to use, especially if you want to talk about failure along the journey. What you ultimately find about Peter's journey is that when he fails, he fails forward and not backward. And that may be one of the most important lessons that you and I can learn in our journey with Christ. Of course, Peter's most famous failure happens just before Jesus' crucifixion. It's the big one. It's where he gets intimidated by a young servant girl and denies he even met, ever met Jesus. He doesn't just do it once. He does it three times. Now, Peter's second most well-known failure is probably the one in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is talking about his coming crucifixion. Looking in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus doesn't say, well, Peter, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on this one. No, he says, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine God telling you, not only are you wrong, but you're actually the devil's mouthpiece right now? Peter has so many mistakes for us to learn from. He's the one who cut off the ear of a high priest's servant when Jesus was arrested, and Jesus told Peter, put your sword away, John 18, 11. Peter is the one 
who after the transfiguration with Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus on the mountain, who said, let us make three shelters as memorials. And I love what Mark writes right after that. He said, it's because he didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Mark 9, 5 through 6. Peter is the one who, when Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet, refused and said, No, you shall never wash my feet. John 13, 8. Peter is the one who was confronted by Paul for backing down in his fellowship with the Gentiles because he was afraid of the hardline Jewish Christians and what they might think in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 through 21. In spite of all of that, if you recall our sermon a few weeks back on the church, you'll remember Peter is the same person about whom Jesus said, You are Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church. Matthew sixteen eighteen. That's a big, bold declaration. And it's comforting to me that Jesus entrusted the beginning of the church to a man who made so many mistakes in his journey with Jesus. Peter teaches us that as long as we keep getting up, as long as we keep walking with Jesus, failure is never final. In your journey with Christ, you will encounter disappointments. You'll slip. You'll even fail. Peter's life shows us that one of the most important things that you can do after a disappointment A loss or a failure is to start back on the path, to re-engage where God was, was taking you. Sure, it's okay to catch your breath. It's okay to, to grab your bearings after a failure. But if you want to keep going with Jesus, you've always got to get back into the game. After his first big failure, Peter was having a tough time re-engaging. Jesus rose from the dead. Peter was in a, a strange and awkward place. Of course, he was thrilled that Jesus was alive, but he also remembered that moment in Luke 22 where someone had said, certainly this fellow was with him. And Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Verses 59 through 61. Sure, Peter was glad that Jesus was back, but still he had those eyes piercing his heart and a pretty serious failure that was hanging over his head. So we see what Peter does in John chapter 21, verse 3. Peter says, I'm going out to fish. And I get it. Maybe he was just trying to clear his head. But if Peter is anything like me, I can imagine the inner dialogue that was going on. Well, I was never any good at being a disciple anyway. I was fishing when he first found me. I told him, go away from me. I am a sinful man. I warned him. And yet he still kept calling me. I'm not a rock. I'm going to stick with what I know and what I am good at. There are ten other guys who can be fishers of men. I just want to be a fisher of fish. On your journey with Jesus... When you fail, when it gets really hard, you're going to be tempted to want to go back to the way it was. There will be something inside of you that's going to call you back to what you knew before you tried something new. Peter may have wanted to be a fisherman again. The problem was that he was called to be a church elder 
and leader. In Romans chapter 11 verse 29 it reminds us for God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. I believe that Jesus invested way too much into Peter up to that point to just let him go back to fishing. In all of those failures, Peter had way too much first-hand education to go back to his old ways. God won't let all those good failures go to waste. His call and gifts are irrevocable. God may redefine the context, the location, maybe even redefine the expression, but no matter what happens on your journey, the call hasn't left. It's irrevocable. Think about that. Something that God calls irrevocable doesn't get taken or called back. The call on Peter to be the rock of the church, it didn't just go away. You're called to be salt and light. You're called to minister God's truth, his life and grace, wherever you go. You can try to go around and just go fishing, but God still has a call on your life. Some of you may have thought that when things didn't work out as you'd hoped, that it was all over. On your journey with Jesus, maybe things didn't work out as you'd planned in your family, or your ministry didn't go where you'd hoped. Your job took a strange turn, but your setback was actually a step up to a future that God has in store for you. The future context of the call, it may be different. The expression may not be what you expected, but if you keep walking with Jesus on this one, he will bring you out of it again. Peter finds a rebirth, a second chance, a path to re-engage. And it shouldn't surprise us at all that this starts by Peter taking a short journey with Jesus. It's found in a beautiful passage of restoration in the Gospel of John in chapter 21 where Jesus and Peter are talking and Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Let's take a look at that together. The Gospel of John chapter 21 beginning in verse 15. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see what Jesus is doing here? In essence, Jesus is bringing him back to the irrevocable call. Peter, you can fish, but you can't be a fisherman. Be a pastor, a shepherd. Be the rock that I've called you to be. And the next time we see Peter, after this restoration with Jesus, he's in a room with the other followers of Christ, he stands up and he finds a replacement for Judas. You know what he's doing? He's leading the church. 
The very next thing he does is stand up again and give the very first altar call where 3,000 people come to salvation in Christ. One of the best things about our journey with Jesus is that only he can see who you truly are and bring you into what you can truly become. Peter saw himself as a fisherman. Jesus saw Peter as the rock for his church. And despite all of Peter's failures, Peter became what God had in mind. On your journey with him, you will become all that God had in mind for you. Consider what happened to Paul on his journey. Jesus took the church's worst enemy and made him into one of the church's greatest assets. We read about the beginning of his journey in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. It's one thing that Paul went from persecuting and capturing and killing Christians to becoming one. It's another thing entirely that he was transformed into the greatest missionary and proclaimer of the gospel that the world has ever known. I cannot overemphasize how big, how important this change is. Without his transformation, Rome wouldn't have known Jesus. Constantine wouldn't have come to know him. Europe wouldn't have come to know him. Who knows if even you or I would have ever heard the name of Jesus. You know, Paul talks about his journey to the young pastor Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, Paul writes, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Do you see the difference it makes in walking with Jesus? The difference that it made for Paul? Before his journey began with Jesus, his life was ignorance, unbelief, and blasphemy and violence. With his journey with Jesus, it caused him to become a man of faith and love and grace. While Peter sort of blundered along before Jesus, Paul was really focused and effective both before and after walking with Jesus. Paul's problem, however, before, it was that he was focused on the wrong things. He was passionate and focused and sincere, but he was still wrong. Unfortunately, that's the powerful idea that many Americans hold on to right now. As long as you're sincere in your journey, 
That's it. That's the big idea. As long as you are sincere, doesn't really matter where you go, doesn't really matter what you think or do, as long as you're sincere. It's so close to being true, but it's not true. And the reason it's close is because sincerity is always better than hypocrisy or half-heartedness. Nobody admires someone who's faking it. Most of us are moved by people who will give themselves completely over to their dream, their faith, and their values. In the beginning, Paul was completely sincere. In fact, he was sincere about the most important thing that we could possibly care about, and that's the will of God. <laughs> But he was wrong. Years after his journey with Jesus began, Paul tells his story to an angry crowd in Jerusalem. In the book of Acts, chapter 22, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Do you know what Paul calls his work, his learning all of his striving before his walk with Jesus. In Philippians 3.8, he calls it all garbage. It's not that learning or hard work or success is bad. It's just that anything of real value and worth is done by God's Spirit in accordance with God's will and in God's Word. Once it was given over to Jesus, Paul's learning was a tool that God used to talk before kings and before philosophers. Once it was given over to Jesus, his zeal was a powerful force in bringing Jesus to the world. Being sincere is an important part of the journey. But sincerity alone is not enough. If you are sincerely wrong, you're still wrong. You're just less likely to admit that you're wrong because you're so sincere. But the journey with Jesus was more powerful than Paul's sincerity. Paul walked hand in hand with Jesus and everything changed. In his journey with Jesus, Paul moved from a life that was dependent on striving in his own strength to a life that was centered entirely around responding to God's Spirit. He started walking by faith, living by grace, and expressing God's love. While Peter's journey shows us that failure is never final, the big idea I want to bring to you from Paul's transformation is that you have two possible approaches. Two approaches for your journey. You can strive in your own strength, or you can respond to God's Spirit. If we're honest... Wouldn't we say that the majority of what we actually do in life is more like making our own to-do list? And then our prayers are just an effort to have God put his initials next to each of the items that we have written down. But if being led by his Spirit is all about allowing him to set the agenda... Wouldn't it look more like giving him a blank piece of paper 
waiting for him to fill it in and then signing our name at the bottom to say, yeah, we agree with everything he wrote before his journey with Jesus began. Paul set the agenda for his life. Not only was it not God's best, it was the very opposite of what God wanted. This is so important because your life is so precious. Your time is short. Friends, you are so skilled, so gifted. How tragic it would be for you to invest so much time, learn so much, and to accomplish so much just to find out in the end it was all about the wrong things. Paul was doing all sorts of things for God that God never wanted. And we do it too. How many of us feel that the message of heaven is do better? Walk faster. Try harder. We're walking down a road that God never called us to walk. We're carrying burdens that God never intended for us to carry. There is not a single time in the Bible where God says, try harder. But over and over again, he said, turn your heart to me. Come to me, draw near to me, turn away from all of this stuff and look at me. We feel so much pressure to be everything, to do everything, to have everything. But I don't think the joy is found in more. I actually think the joy is found in less. When Jesus was ministering in Israel, there was so much hurt and need and work that had to be done. But you never see in Jesus a man who is stressed out and overwhelmed. He lived by the Spirit. He did what the Father did. we got to do this. We gotta get that. We gotta be this in life. I guess I just want to ask do we really? Paul had a new agenda set by the Spirit of God, and to be sure, he worked hard. But he wasn't harried. And it seems like neither he nor Jesus were ever running behind, never trying to just catch up. They just walked every day by God's Spirit. And when we walk hand in hand with Jesus, we too can walk with the intensity of Paul or the bumbling of Peter. Either way, we will go forward. Either way, our journey will produce amazing transformation in us and an amazing kingdom results in those around us. If we walk that way, everything that happens on our journey can be used for God's glory and I do mean everything. During the Watergate scandal, Chuck Colson was President Nixon's hatchet man. In 1974, he pled guilty to obstruction of justice and he went to prison. And in his book, Born Again, Colson wrote, I found myself increasingly drawn to the idea that God had put me in prison for a purpose, and that I should do something for those I had left behind. Now, when he got out, he launched Prison Fellowship, which is now the nation's largest nonprofit organization serving prisoners. 
from a prison inmate to prison fellowship. I'd call that failing forward. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8, the prophet gives us a simple formula to follow. He writes, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I don't know exactly where your journey with Jesus will take you, but I do know if you walk with him every day, it will go forward to places that you could never imagine. We began our journey a few weeks ago on Easter morning. Each week, we looked at a variety of challenges as we live by the transforming power of the resurrection. I want to end our series together by offering you the most important challenge of all. For you to walk with Jesus every day. Starting tomorrow, let's not have Jesus just be a part of our lives. Let's make him the center of our lives every day. And follow anywhere and everywhere that he leads us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a precious gift you have given us to be able to walk with you, to be filled with your Holy Spirit, to understand and to put into practice the gifts that you've given us. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that you would give us a deeper understanding of those gifts. And even when we stumble, even if we fail, even if we, through sincerity, get off course, and we turn to you to bring us back onto the path, Father, I pray that you would not allow ourselves to become too discouraged, and that we would lean into your Holy Spirit to give us the strength and the insight the discernment to continue our walk with you. I look forward to the day when we can stand before you and hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. I hope you have an awesome week. Be sure to stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.